Call it fate, call it chance, call it a bizarre coincidence that leaves you scratching your head in bewilderment. We've all heard of those true stories that sound so utterly implausible they stretch the very fabric of believability. Whether it's a single person experiencing a repeated event again or again, or a specific date that comes to define a culture or even a nation, the most extraordinary bizarre coincidences have a habit of sending a slight shiver down the spine. They test the bedrock on which we base our assumptions of the world, questioning our own understanding and often blowing apart our safely packaged views of how things generally play out. Bizarre coincidences occur every day, yet they usually pass us by without so much as a flicker of acknowledgement. However, some stories are so spectacular, they've become lodged within a historical chronicle. Stories that make no sense and seem to bend the very rules of our world. Tsutomu Yamaguchi died on the 4th of January 2010 in the Japanese city of Nagasaki at the impressive age of 93. Of course, Japan is known for churning out age-defying people, with just over 15% of the population now above the age of 80. Most put this down to a healthy diet, a much more social version of retirement than we have in the West, and their ikigai, their sense of purpose, their reason for living. However, even by Japanese standards, Tsutomu Yamaguchi, reaching his 93rd birthday, bordered on the miraculous. As World War II reached its hellish conclusion in the Pacific theater, Yamaguchi, who lived in Nagasaki and worked for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, traveled to Hiroshima for a three-month business trip. On the 6th of August, he and his two colleagues were walking to the train station to return to Nagasaki when Yamaguchi realized he'd forgotten his ID at the hotel. Leaving his partners, he returned, collected his ID, and then was heading towards the city's dock area at 8.15 a.m. when he noticed two small parachutes drifting down towards the earth. Blinding light, and then an intense boom knocked Yamaguchi to the ground. His eardrums ruptured. His sight was temporarily lost. Radiation burns were already creeping across the left-hand side of his body. He lay unmoving for a few minutes before hauling himself to his feet. Yamaguchi had been one of the estimated 350,000 people in Hiroshima when the world's first atomic bomb had landed. Despite being just three kilometers or 1.8 miles from the impact zone, Yamaguchi eventually crawled to a nearby shelter and somehow managed to meet up with his colleagues who had also survived. Today I want to talk to you about a solution that could protect all of your internet browsing. You see, we're living in a world where online privacy is becoming more and more important, but don't worry, I've got just the thing to keep you covered. It's called Surfshark and it's a VPN. You won't believe how easy it is to protect all of your internet activities with Surfshark. With them, everything important stays private and secure. Now, one of the coolest things about Surfshark is that it lets you virtually travel the world in just one click. Say you're in Spain, but you want to access the biggest movie catalog on Netflix in Canada. With Surfshark, you can change your virtual location and enjoy content from anywhere. And guess what? Surfshark isn't just about streaming, it's perfect for travelers too. When you're on the go, you can connect to your country back home and never miss out on your favorite content. Plus, Surfshark helps you get past annoying geo blocks and government restrictions no more FOMO. You'll have access to blocked websites and apps with just a single click. They also keep you safe on public Wi-Fi, so whether you're at a cafe, traveling, or exploring new places, your data will stay encrypted and secure. Also, online shopping lovers, well, listen up. With Surfshark, you can get the best deals without websites showing you prices based on location. Plus, there's great add-ons, Surfshark Alert, Antivirus, Search, it's all there. So head to surfshark.deals forward slash side projects and enter the promo code side projects to get a whopping 83% off and three extra months for free. Thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring and now back to today's video. The following morning, Yamaguchi returned to Nagasaki and reported for work two days later, quite remarkably considering his injuries. At 11 a.m. on the 9th of August, he was relaying the story of Hiroshima to his boss when another ferocious eruption tore his world apart. The world's second atomic bomb had just been dropped, and again, Yamaguchi was a mere three kilometers or 1.8 miles from where it fell. This time, he was uninjured, but the chaos meant he could not change his bandages, eventually leading to fever and severe infection. He battled through, and despite being at the epicenter of not one, but two nuclear bombs, Yamaguchi lived for another 65 years. The exact number of deaths involved with the two bombings has always been vague, but it's thought to be between 129,000 and 226,000, many of whom were further away from the epicenters than Yamaguchi. Call him lucky, call him horrendously unlucky, it just wasn't his time. So the same applies to our next example of bizarre coincidences in history. On the 10th of April 1912, just after midday, the vast bulk of the RMS Titanic slowly inched away from the dock in Southampton. Thousands had come to witness this historic moment, the maiden voyage of a ship of extraordinary size, which was unsinkable. 
if the rumors were to be believed. Aboard the Titanic, as she steered clear of British waters, was Violet Jessops, an Argentine woman with Irish heritage working as a stewardess and a nurse. The fact that she was even going out to sea again took some courage, as just the year before, she had been on board the RMS Olympic, one of three sister ships that included the Olympic Titanic and Britannic when HMS Hawk rammed into it by accident. The Olympic was able to limp back to Southampton with two gaping holes in her hulls and Jessops had to find alternative employment. Seven months later, she took her place on the Titanic, no doubt her soothing her fears by saying that lightning's never going to strike twice. However, as we know, lightning definitely does strike twice and sometimes more times. Four days after leaving Southampton, the mighty ship struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank within three hours. Jessops was initially deployed on deck after the incident to act as an example for non-English speaking passengers. But but eventually it took her place in lifeboat 16 before it was lowered into the freezing waters. After watching the ship disappear beneath the dark waves, those in the lifeboat were picked up by the RMS Carpathia the following morning and taken on to New York. Then, four and a half years later, war had broken out and Jessops was now on board the third of the three ships, HMS Britannic, which had been converted into a hospital ship. On the 21st of November 1916, the Britannic was ruptured by a mighty explosion, later found to be a mine, and sank within an hour, killing 32 of the 1,066 people on board. One of those was very nearly Violet Jessops after her lifeboat was pulled toward the churning propeller. She managed to jump clear but suffered a traumatic head injury as a result. Jessops later died at the ripe old age of 83 after spending the rest of her working life, really, this is true, working on cruise liners. Now, as impressive as this is, We've actually got it beat. Not much is known about Arthur John Priest. He was born in 1887, died in 1937, aged 49, and worked for many years as a stoker in the bowels of ships, shoveling coal into the furnace and generally doing what you would consider to be probably the worst job on the ship. That may be the case, but Priest's luck was beyond extraordinary. During his tenure at sea, he survived four sinkings and two major collisions, which included RMS Astorius, collision on a major voyage in 1908, RMS Olympic, collision with the HMS Hawk, RMS Titanic, Iceberg 1912, HMS Alacantara, sunk in combat in 1916, HMS Britannic, sunk by a mine in 1916, and SS Donegal, torpedoed by SMUC-27 in 1917. After the sinking of the SS Donegal, Priest retired from the sea, claiming that no Nobody wished to sail with him after that. He's remembered today as the unsinkable stoker. Fate sometimes intertwines with the human story, but what about specific dates? In Germany, the 9th of November is called Schicksalstag, the Day of Fate, a day that has repeatedly popped up during German history over the last 150 years and has seen some of the nation's most seismic events. Between 1848 and 1989, five events that significantly changed Germany in one way or another occurred on the 9th of November. It began on the 9th of November 1848 with the execution of Robert Blum, a revolutionary politician who had taken part in the upheavals of 1848, which sparked the German Revolution. Revolution. Blum was a liberal who believed in equality of the sexes and greater freedom and vehemently opposed anti-Semitism. When protests began sweeping the German lands with demands for liberal principles and improvements to working and living conditions at their core, Blum flung himself into the cause. However, he and the revolution that he helped start died before they could even get going. The conservative aristocracy won the day, and you can't help but wonder how history might have been different had the outcome gone the other way. The second event came as World War I was limping to its sad conclusion. With 1.7 million Germans dead due to the needless war that ultimately brought Germany zero gains, significant changes were pretty inevitable. On the 9th of November 1918, Chancellor Max von Baden announced the abdication of Wilhelm II, even before the Kaiser did himself, and the German Republic was declared Later that day. The choppy waters took a dramatic turn over the next two decades, and on the 9th of November 1923, a man named Adolf Hitler attempted a poorly planned coup d'etat involving 2,000 Nazi members marching through the streets of Munich. They were stopped by police officers who eventually opened fire, killing 16 Nazis in the process. While Hitler fled the scene, he was eventually captured and sentenced to five years in prison, during which his infamous saga, Mein Kampf, was written. The events brought the Hitler persona into the national public eye for the first time. After just nine months in prison, he was released, presumably because authorities authorities assumed he would play no further threat in the future. But of course, he was a threat. On the 9th of November 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, erupted, which saw Jewish properties and businesses attacked across Germany, and more than 90 Jewish Germans were killed. 267 synagogues were left in rubble, 7,000 businesses were damaged or destroyed, and 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and eventually shipped to the first concentration camps. If there was the slightest doubt over Hitler's plans for the Jewish people, this particular 9th of November answered that question emphatically. 
If most of these dates are looked upon with painful reflection, the final 9th of November was much better. In 1989, after heated political back and forth, along with a steadily increasing army of protesters, the first sections of the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. A momentous date that completely changed Germany and birthed modern nations. The 9th was initially considered the day of unity, but because of its association with the past, the 3rd of October was chosen instead. If the 9th of November is the day of fate in Germany, the 19th of September is the day of horror in Mexico. On three separate occasions, on this date in 1985, 2017, and just last year in 2022, the ground in and around Mexico City began shaking. A twisted version of Ground All Day, or just a terrible coincidence? Of the three, the first was the most devastating. Striking at 7.17 a.m. with many still in their homes, the event measured an 8 on the Richter scale and killed at least 5,000 people, with some estimates going up to 40,000 in the greater Mexico area. The long duration of the shaking led to thousands of buildings coming down and the city as a whole losing 30% of its available living space. 32 years later, commemorations were held around Mexico to mark those lost in the 1985 earthquake. As part of the commemorations, a national earthquake drill was held on the same day at 11 a.m., and on the 19th of September 2007, these were all carried out without a hitch. And then it began again. At 1.14 p.m. local time, a 7.1 earthquake with an epicenter around 55 kilometers or 35 miles south of Puebla again brought buildings down, with 228 falling in Mexico City alone. While the death count was much lower at 370, the devastation was similarly severe, and over 6,000 people were injured. Five years later, once again, on the 19th of September, a national earthquake drill was held across the country around midday, but less than an hour later, the real thing arrived. The 7.7 .7 earthquake hit at 1.05 p.m. between the Mexican states of Michoacan and Colima. Despite widespread damage once again, only two deaths were attributed to the earthquake, with a further two occurring during its aftershock. Whether it's the day of fate or the day of horror, they are bizarre coincidences that are enough to leave your mind humming as it draws near again. The First World War delivered death on a scale previously unimagined. Around 20 million people died during this period, half service personnel and half civilians, with profound effects that stretched for decades after the war's conclusion. But did you know that it all began with a sandwich? The story that we're often told in rather blasé terms is that Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir presumptive to the throne of Austria-Hungary, was assassinated in Sarajevo, sparking World War I. While this is all entirely accurate, it tells just a fraction of the astonishing coincidence that led up to it. You see, the initial attempt on Ferdinand's life was a complete and utter failure. Despite six separate assassins walking along the planned route, the only meaningful effort resulted in one of the bombs landing beneath one of the cars traveling with the Archduke. The royal party was able to attend their planned event, but then decided decided to leave and visit those in the hospital because of the earlier attack. At the same time, Gavrilo Princip, one of the six assassins, considered his options and whether he could find a spot to lie in wait for the returning Archduke. As many do, Princip thought he'd think better with a bit of food in his stomach, and so he stopped at Schiller's Delicatessen near the Latin Bridge. Three cars suddenly appeared on the road, and the third was carrying the Archduke. The first two turned down a side street, but when the Archduke's driver did the same, he was informed by Governor Potiorek, also in the car, that he was going the wrong way. There seems to have been a change in routing plans that hadn't been relayed to everybody, and suddenly a car carrying the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne was all alone on a quiet Sarajevo street. The driver attempted to reverse, but only succeeded in stalling the car. And, would you believe it, he did it a stone's throw from Schiller's Delicatessen, where Gavrilo Princip was sitting and enjoying a sandwich. In one of the most astonishing twists of fate, Princip put down his food, retrieved his gun, and walked calmly towards the car before firing two shots inside. Both the Archduke and his wife, Sophie, Duchess of Hohenberg, died shortly after, and within a month, the bloodiest war the Earth had ever seen erupted. And it all came down to a quick stop for a sandwich.